in what professions uh in your experience are we most we touched on this already but i just want to go circle back and are we most likely to see a preponderance of narcissists right I'm thinking, I mean, the, the exhibitionist professions, I'm thinking filmmaking, I'm thinking acting, I'm thinking, um, what about the corporate space? Yes. Actually, the corporate space is the only space where we have studies. Mm -hmm. We do not, believe it or not, have studies with regards to actors, the entertainment industry, show mm -hmm. business, mass media, social media. Mm -hmm. uh, we have studies with regards to the medical profession. And we have mm. studies with regards to um, corporate settings. Mm. We don't have a single study about therapists, psychologists, psychiatrists. Mm. Tells you all. So we don't know how many, what percentage of psychiatrists, therapists, psychologists. No. Um, right. That's, that's really interesting. And even worse, mm. to obtain a degree in psychology or psychiatry, you don't need to pass any mental health tests. You mm -hmm. can be a raving lunatic, dangerous mm -hmm. to yourself and to others, mm -hmm. and end up treating people. You could be unboundaried. For example, you could be a borderline. What is the Hannibal Lecter um, case? <laughs> yeah, I mean. yeah, it's real. It's factual. Mm -hmm. You could mm -hmm. be Hannibal Lecter and mm -hmm. treat people. So, and this is, of course, a guild, guild approach. You know, it's a monopoly. Mm -hmm. And when there's a monopoly, a professional monopoly, and when there's a monopoly, uh, standards are lowered and or non-existent mm. of course someone who intends to become a therapist or a psychologist or a psychiatrist before starting the first year must be screened for a variety of mental health issues starting mm. i mean psychotic disorders personality disorders mood disorders some of them are seriously dangerous seriously dangerous so today it's a russian roulette you attend therapy with someone you have no idea how boundary it is, how violent it is, how aggressive it may be. Will he blackmail you? Will he rape you? You can't tell. Simply you can't tell. It's a Russian ruling. But in corporate settings, it seems that narcissists and psychopaths are overrepresented um, by 500% compared to the general population. So 3 to 5%, for example, mm. of chief executive officers of Fortune 500 have been diagnosed with psychopathy and or na malignant narcissism. But how would you get CEOs to take, I, I presume that's the hair test, right? How would you get the hair, to... the hair and baby? It's, these are studies by hair and baby up to people. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. They, they were administered the PCLR, the PCLR designed by Robert Hare. Mm. They, they, attention, they're narcissists. What do you mean? <laughs> they, yeah, but yeah, yeah, yeah I know what you mean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exclusive yeah, yeah. study, <laughs> the part of history, the part of history. Okay, so we're saying three to five percent of CEOs, and in the general population, we're it's saying about one, it's about about one percent. Similarly, among surgeons, which yeah. is the only segment of the medical profession to have been studied, mm. the preponderance of psychopathy is much higher than in the general population. There is even a famous, I think, neurosurgeon or neuroscientist, Fallon, who who has been diagnosed with psychopathy and outed himself, mm. admitted that he's been diagnosed with psychopathy. <laughs> mm. So we have a case study. And there was a very famous play David Mammoth wrote. Um, it was converted into a movie called Malice. And it's it, he talks about the God complex with, with the surgeon, right? And the, oppor the, the, the opportunity to play God, a life and death with somebody at your hand, at your fingertips. And that's, that's part of the attraction. There is this, and there is the fact that you have to cut someone. Mm. <laughs> I mean, uh, wow. Well, I mm. don't know if uh, you can do it. Do you I, think I, corporate, I mean, uh, do you think corporate, culture rewards and incentivizes um, potentially psychopathic, sociopathic behavior? There's a school in uh, psychology nowadays, in academic psychology. There's a mm. school. Kevin Dutton, Maccoby, many others. Mm. They, they focus on what they call high-functioning narcissists. Mm. These are narcissists who are beneficial to society. They're pro-social, they're communal. They're beneficial to society because they're daring, they're risk takers. Um, they lack empathy, which is good when you are, for example, a soldier or a mm. surgeon or a corporate executive who has to fire 5,000 people mm. or whatever. So mm. they lack empathy. Everything that seems to be wrong with narciss narcissism uh, in certain settings and environments is actually a positive adaptation. That's the idea. 
And so evolutionary psychology, schooling psychology, evolutionary psychology suggests that narcissism did not just, it's not a mutation, a, a bad mutation. It's not just an accident, a bad accident, but on the mm -hmm. very contrary, it's a positive adaptation that was carried forward through the generations because it has, it has had some value or benefit to survival, survival value. Mm -hmm. So, and indeed narcissists, because they are so hell-bent on obtaining narcissistic supply and garnering attention and so on, narcissists are creative. Hans Eysenck suggested the quality of psychoticism, mm -hmm. which, is a, which in, includes an element of creativity. Mm -hmm. He said that creative people actually are kind of psychotic. It's not exactly psychotic, but like a bit psychotic. So... And uh, but what I might dispute that the creative people tend to be highly empathetic by nature. Some, some, and, and some. I, w I wouldn't generalize in this mm. in this way. Unfortunately, I cannot. I cannot kind of participate in this dialogue. I cannot be your interlocutor because I don't have data. Mm -hmm. um, anecdotal, maybe, but I don't have data. Anecdotally, anecdotally, I'm, I, I have worked a little bit, and I, I do find that the, the warmth and the empathetic nature of, of the listen story. i'm a i'm a i'm an awarded uh, author of short fiction mm. in in hebrew in israel awarded i won israel's second most pre prestigious award of literature mm. um and i don't have uh, a hint of empathy a trace of empathy i'm clinically a psychopathic narcissist so i wouldn't generalize Mm -hmm. Definitely not based on anecdotes. That was that is what science is for. Mm -hmm. We gather no, data, we arrange, classify mm -hmm. it, and we, you know, mm -hmm. but we don't have science here. Mm -hmm. Okay, I science. accept it. Accept it. Um, it is a massive generalization. So, okay, so we're saying that um, in the corporate space, we'll say three to five. We're saying three to five percent generally. That's the only place we have data because it hasn't been and surgeons, medical and surgeons. surgeons. Yeah. And we we know that we were saying the general population is one percent or less, about one percent. Yeah. Um. Okay. So, what what I want to ask you about is strategies in dealing with narcissists, right? Actually, before I do that, can I ask you what the difference is between a psychopath and a sociopath? Sociopath is not a clinical term, mm. although it's it is used in academic literature here and there. Mm. It's not a clinical term. Mm. Not, not a rigorous. By the way, psychopath is not a clinical term. You will it's not find the word. You will not find the word psychopath in the diagnostic and statistical manual, and not because they haven't considered it. Mm. Successive committees over forty years, four zero, mm. have considered the inclusion of psychopathy in the DSM and have rejected it because they reach a conclusion it's not a rigorous clinical entity. So psychopathy and sociopathy are hype media hype, and to some extent academic hype, and again, there's a lot of money in this. Mm. Robert Hare became a multi-millionaire by selling, by licensing the PCLR, especially to corporations. So he has an incentive. He's no longer an unbiased scientist. Mm. He has an incentive to propagate and perpetuate the diagnosis of psychopathy. Are Sociopathy... In the so, APD, the antisocial personality disorder, is yes. that the, the, the umbrella term for them? Yes, antisocial personality disorder, in its most extreme end of the spectrum, is allegedly psychopathy. Okay. But you could have antisocial personality disorder people who are not psychopaths, and there is work by Martha Stout, mm. for example, the sociopath next door, um, and she describes run-of-the-mill pedestrian psychopaths who are not serial mm. killers, and mm. they are not, you know, just your neighbor. Now, sociopath is someone who, well, the distinction is, is, is sociopath is someone who is socially and culturally um, rebellious, defiant, again, contumacious, rejects authority, refuses to fit in, refuses to conform. It used to be called in the 19th century uh, social character disorder. Mm. Social social character illness or sickness mm. disease. Mm. So it it's sociopath is is a lot more relational. It's not the individual, but the individual's interactions are somehow abnormal, dysfunctional, or problematic to other people. 
I would say that a sociopath is defined by the impact that he has on other people, rather than by anything innate. Mm. A psychopath, on the other hand, is supposedly a clinical entity in the sense that even if a psychopath were to be totally isolated on a, on a cell or an island, he would still be a psychopath. Mm. He would still be, for example, defined. He would defy, he would defy nature. He would still be contumacious. He would spit on God. He would still be reckless. He would do crazy things and endanger his life and the life of others, if there are others. But even if he were totally isolated, he would, could immediately tell he's a, he's a psychopath. Mm. If you were to isolate a sociopath, mm. sociopathy would vanish in the absence of other people. The context is a contextual mm. problem, mm. contextual mm. disorder, where psychopath doesn't depend on context. Narcissism, for example, is a contextual disorder. When you isolate the narcissist from potential sources of narcissistic supply mm. and from potential partners in the shared fantasy, by the way, a key feature of narcissism, which we haven't mentioned. Mm. So if you isolate the narcissist from other people who are relevant, significant participants, collaborators in principle, mm. he ceases to be a narcissist. For example, when you place narcissists in prison, mm. they are no longer narcissistic. They are no longer narcissists. They don't behave as narcissists. They develop empathy. They are not, they don't, they have positive impact on other people and so on and so forth. Why? Because if you are a narcissist in prison, it affects your longevity or health. Mm. Usually both. Mm -hmm. So the narcissist is a major incentive in prison to stop <laughs> being a narcissist. And suddenly he's not. I know mm. because I did time mm, mm, mm. and I've been able to observe myself and many other narcissists because prisons are flooded with narcissists and psychopaths, flooded. And yet in all my time there, mm. I have never come once across an expression or manifestation of narcissism, not once. I haven't come across disempathy. I haven't come across criminal or antisocial acts. I have not once. It's pretty amazing. In prison. In prison. Because in prison, the sanction, the price, mm -hmm. the cost of being a narcissist mm -hmm. is unacceptable. So mm -hmm. you stop being a narcissist. Mm -hmm. In other words, it's a contextual mm -hmm. relational disorder. That's why I don't think these are clinical entities, really. Mm -hmm. I think it the only means... clinical entity in cluster B is bodily. Yeah. It also means that it's not immutable. It's not genetic, um, and mm. it's not it. It's it, it, it. It's pathological in that it's diseased, but a disease can be cured. No, I'm sorry that if I gave it's my fault if I gave the wrong impression. What okay. happens in prison is behavior modification. Okay, the disease or the disorder doesn't go away. Okay, it's just that the narcissist is able to modify his behavior to the point that he is no longer diagnosable as a narcissist. We call this subclinical narcissism. Mm. Have you heard of the dark triad? I assume you did. Yeah. So in dark triad, again, self-styled experts online misrepresent the dark triad. Dark triad is not narcissism or psychopathy. Dark triad is subclinical narcissism, subclinical psycho psychopathy and Machiavellianism. So in dark triad, there's someone who cannot be diagnosed as a narcissist, although we know that he has narcissistic traits and behaviors and so on, mm -hmm. but he cannot be diagnosed. And similarly, he cannot be diagnosed with psychopathy, but he's manipulative, he's Machiavellian. Narcissists, when they enter prison, become subclinical narcissists. It's a fascinating transition. And it means that most, if not all, the behaviors of the narcissist, which are abrasive, antisocial, hurtful, harmful, all these behaviors can definitely be suppressed, modified, eliminated even, if the prison term is 10 years, they're eliminated effect. And it's adaptive to the environment. Yes. Uh, it's so reactive. would it return then when the, when the prisoner is released? Would it yes. organically just naturally return when, the, when they go back into society? Yes, it would. That's what I'm saying. The disease yeah. is there. Mm. Disorder is there. Mm. 
it's just that it is repressed to the point that it is no longer diagnosable. Mm. We have a similar situation with some therapies. For example, we have dialectical behavior therapy, mm. DBT. Dialectical behavior therapy is a therapy of choice for borderline personality disorder. And it's amazing. Mm. It teaches the borderline to regulate her emotions, to control her impulses, to, to stabilize her moods. It's stunning. It's the most successful therapy there is, by the way, statistically speaking. 50% of people treated with DBT lose the borderline personality disorder diagnosis in one year and never regain it. And we're not, there's no chemical intervention here. There's no, no prescript. Nothing. There's nothing. It's all. There's a individual therapy and group therapy. That's all. And 50% lose the diagnosis and never regain it. It has a 50% success rate. Just to give mm. you an indication, that's five times the success rate of CBT, which is the hallowed, the <laughs> sacred uh, preserve of therapy. So it's amazing. It's an amazing therapy. By the way, developed by a patient, mm. developed by someone who, who has had borderline personality disorder. She started to develop it in a mental asylum. Amazing story. Now she's a psychologist, but she started as a, as a patient. So when you administer DBT, the person can no longer be diagnosed with borderline personality disorder because she has learned behavioral techniques. She has learned to manipulate herself, to modify her behaviors, to control them somehow, mm. to channel them, to sublimate them, to render them socially acceptable, and so mm. on. But it doesn't mean she's not a borderline anymore, actually. The critical core dynamics, psychodynamics, they're there. Mm -hmm. They're absolutely there. And so when we're trying to explain to clients or patients, if you go to DBT, you'll no longer have this, 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 and this. But everything else will remain. For example, you'll continue to feel empty. Mm -hmm. There's a problem of emptiness in borderline. Not only in borderline, in narcissism as well. Okay. It's known as the schizoid empty core. You'll mm -hmm. continue to feel empty inside. Mm -hmm. And this cannot be tackled in any way, shape, or form. Same with the narcissist. The narcissist continues to feel grandiose. He continues to have to, to hold everyone in contempt. He continues to feel superior. He continues to feel discriminated against and victimized. He, it's, all this continues. Mm. Only you can't say this in prison. If you hold someone in contempt and you meet him in the showers later, mm -hmm. it's going to end badly. Mm -hmm. So no um, contempt. If somebody, I want to ask you from, from a gender perspective, right? First, I want to ask you about if a young woman... Uh, is, is embarking upon a relationship with a man and she thinks everything is going great. She's found this, she's loved this guy, he's fantastic, but there's something she feels is not right. How could that young woman, um, or any woman, what's the checklist for her to, to try and figure out, is this guy potentially a narcissistic abuser? What would your perspective be? And then I want to ask you from the male perspective. In 1970, there was a Japanese, of course, Japanese, roboticist. And he came up with the concept of uncanny valley. Masahiro, Masahiro Mori was his name. He suggested that as robots become more and more human-like, as they become, as become androids, mm -hmm. we are going to develop an extreme feeling of unease in their presence. Not because they don't resemble humans, but because they, be, they have become indistinguishable from humans. And yet something in us, gut feeling, intuition, instinct, call it what you want, something in us is going to signal to us, this is not a full-fledged, fully-baked human. Something is off-key. Mm. Some note is wrong in this symphony. And, and he called it the uncanny valley. valley. Um, when you come across a narcissist or a psychopath, regardless of the setting, you are likely to have an uncanny valley reaction. You're likely to react to the narcissist or psychopath as if they were not fully human, not fully composed, not full fledged, not fully put together or put together wrongly, or there's an off key or something. You know. And it's going to know at you. It's going to, you know. It's an intuitive thing. Yes. Um, yeah. Yeah. We know, for example, that when two people meet, they exchange a gigantic amount of information via, via smell. They exchange about 100 items 
via smell alone, mm. including the composition of the immune system, uh, many of the genetic properties and so on and so forth are exchanged within a split, a microsecond, on a first encounter of less than two meters distance. Wow. So a lot of information is being exchanged. Body language, of course, micro expressions, mm. facial expressions, the way I the way I comb my hair. I mean, a lot, a lot mm. is exchanged. Some argue that the vast majority of information is exchanged non-verbally on a first encounter. That's why first depressions, you know. So, so what you're saying, Sam, is for a young woman or any woman is really trust your innate instincts, yes. your, your intuition as yes. the number one reference yes. point. A hundred percent. And so, but this is the first line of defense. Mm. This is the Maginot line. And then start to observe. Mm. Is he breaching your boundaries? Does he treat you as an extension of himself? Does he make decisions for you? On the first date. He orders drinks without consulting you. Or he chooses a restaurant. Or he, you know, he decides mm -hmm. what you're going to do during the evening. I'm going to watch a movie now. You know. So that's a breach of boundaries and ignoring your autonomy, uh, agency, and independence. Mm -hmm. Second thing, and by far the most critical, how does he treat others? Mm -hmm. Because with you, it's an act. Mm -hmm. Narcissists interact with, with potential intimate partners in a sequence that is kabuki sequence. It's mm. rigid, it's dictated, and it's never changing, immutable. So the first thing they do is they love bomb. Love bombing starts subtly, the way he looks at you, the way. So with you, it's an act. You can't mm. trust the information that you gather by being with the narcissist on the first date. Instead, monitor and observe how the narcissist relates to other people. So the waiters at the table, other the people as you want. Yeah. Mm. yeah. How does yeah. he? Because there, he won't bother to act. But he there's nothing to gain from them. So obviously, he'll show his true self, if you like. N moreover, yeah. the underlings and subordinates and service providers mm. provoke, trigger the narcissist's grandiosity, his worst features. Mm. But narcissists are in this sense a bit sadistic mm. so this provokes his worst features similarly pay attention to what happens in stressful situations when things don't go right somehow does he become paranoid does he become aggressive does he curse does he break things does he pay a lot of attention to that mm. his speech patterns speech patterns are crucial Narcissists are not really interested in other people. They want to talk about themselves. Or mm. when they pretend to listen to you, they're planning their next their next performance. You know? mm. So he's likely suddenly to ask a question, the answer to which you've already provided. He was simply not listening. He's likely to, to talk about himself, his work, his accomplishments, his brilliant future, and so on and so forth. I'm doing this to you in this interview. Actually, my speech patterns are to some extent disrespectful. So it's an indicator of narcissism. These are enough. On the first How day. do you mean, Sam? How? Give me an example. In this interview specifically. I'm leveraging you to say what I want to say. I know that. And that's typical in an interview. In any mm -hmm. interview, up to a point. Mm -hmm. And beyond that point, it's disrespectful. Mm -hmm. Now, I yeah. don't disrespect you because I think you're unintelligent. I actually think you're intelligent. So there you have my respect. But I disrespect you because you're a tool. Mm -hmm. You're an instrument. You have no separate external existence. Narcissists are not capable of perceiving the externality and separateness of other people because they've never been able to separate from the maternal figure and individuate. Mm. Narcissism is a failure in separation and individuation. Mm -hmm. So they are still symbiotically enmeshed in a, with a maternal figure in their mind. And they relate to other people the same way. Mm. Uh, we are one now. And of course, because we are one now, you are not external, you're not separate from me. Because mm. we are one now and because clearly I'm superior to you, then you are my tool, mm. my instrument. My so... Uh, 
what else from from uh, from a female perspective? I think we know we understand what a woman, a young woman, should be looking for. Is there anything else before we switch it to the male perspective? Yes, the alacrity, the alacrity of the process. Okay, he would want to marry you on a second date and have, and plan having th on having three children with you on the third date. Okay, the speed. It's abnormal. It's unnatural. We want to move in, move in with you by the end mm -hmm. of the first day. Mm -hmm. Very common occurrence, by the way. Mm -hmm. Move in with you on the first day. Join bank accounts, whatever. Uh, the speed. The speed mm -hmm. should alarm you seriously. Mm -hmm. The narcissist relates to potential intimate partners via a process known as shared fantasy. It was first described by Sander in 1989. Mm -hmm. The shared fantasy, in the shared fantasy, the narcissist creates a script, the equivalent of a theater play or a movie. Mm. And then he casts you. It's type, it's casting, casting central. He mm. casts you in a role. And you're supposed to play the, this role within the fantasy. Now, mm. within the fantasy, you idealize each other. The narcissist first idealizes you. And because you will have become ideal, it idealizes him. Mm. He's in possession of an ideal object, you. Only an ideal person can possess an ideal object. So that makes him ideal. And this process is known as co-idealization. And then the shared fantasy progresses into, into its inevitable conclusion, which is devaluation, separation, devaluation, uh, devaluation, separation, individuation. So mm -hmm. the narcissist converts you into a maternal figure. By the way, even in same-sex relationships, even when the narcissist is a woman, mm -hmm. The narcissist converts the intimate partner into a maternal figure because the narcissist wants to reenact the early conflict with the biological original mother and wants to separate from her and become an individual, wants to grow up through the agency of the intimate partner. So the intimate mm. partner becomes a mother and then the narcissist needs to push her away and the only way he knows how to do this is to devalue her and then he separates from her and discards her. This process is autonomous, automatic, and ineluctable. There's absolutely nothing you can do. If you're the best conceivable partner, most loving and caring and empathic and holding, you name it, you sacrifice yourself, you're codependent, you, you're a doormat. Nothing is going to help because the narcissist needs to devalue you and separate from you because you are his mother, you're his new mother. Of course, the narcissist gives you the same treatment. He becomes your mother. He provides you with con unconditional love. He regresses you to a much earlier age. And that is why this whole relationship is, apropos our earlier conversation, is addictive. The partner doesn't fall in love with the narcissist. The partner falls in love with herself through the narcissist's gaze. Mm -hmm. The narcissist idealizes her. And then he gives, he provides her with access to this idealization. And then she falls in love with her own idealized image. It's intoxicating. It's exactly what happens to a baby with his mother. The mother idealizes the baby. And the baby gains access to his nascent self, to his emerging self, mm -hmm. through the mother's gaze. So initially, the baby's self is idealized, and that's why all babies are narcissists. Mm. The narcissists, mm. because the mother, the mother idealizes them, and then they come to believe this. They come to create a self around this idealization, and that allows them to take on the world, to explore the world. This is the sequence: the mother idealizes the baby. The baby feels godlike. Mm. The baby feels idealized, and now he can take on the world because he's god. It's a critical, healthy feature of early childhood. The mother's gaze is crucial in pushing the child away from her and into the world. It's as, as if the mother is saying, listen, baby, you are God. You are ideal. You don't need me. You don't need me anymore. You can take mm -hmm. on the world. Go ahead. Take on the world. And the child begins to explore the world and then discovers that there are other people in the world and develops object relations, ability mm -hmm. to interact with other people. This is all very crucial. What the narcissist does, he takes himself and his partner 
and he regresses both of them to age two prior to this stage of separation individuation and they become enmeshed they become a single unit codependent and, and trauma bonded is that the is that the kind of phraseology we would use that, that, that they're creating their own trauma and bonding themselves together trauma bond is is a controversial and misunderstood concept mm. um Layman thing, the trauma bonding is that you bond with a narcissist because he has a capacity to traumatize you mm. and then the capacity to, to reconcile with you. Mm. Intermittent reinforcement, black and uh, hot and cold. You know? So the narcissist loves you and then the narcissist hates you, but he has the capacity to love you. So you become addicted to this cycle. You say, mm. he hates me now, he's aggressive, he's violent. I need to get his love back. But I need to get it. I will get his love. Mm. Not that I need to get his love. I know that I will because intermittent reinforcement is the pattern of the relationship. So mm. if I wait long enough, I'll get the love back. Mm. And there's no love like it, as I just said. This is the kind of love that a mother has for mm. the baby. It's unconditional. It's all oceanic. Consuming. It's oceanic. Mm. It's all consuming, exactly. So, mm. so it's worth waiting for. So this is the layman's interpretation of trauma bonding. But the truth is that it's, it's a much deeper and seriously pernicious phenomenon. It's what the narcissist does. He triggers your, your other traumas. He triggers previous traumas. Mm. He, he pushes the buttons, the trauma buttons in you. And because he's the one to push the trauma buttons, he acquires omnipotence over you. Only he has the power. His finger is on the button. Mm. Only he has the power to remove it. And you want him to remove yeah. it more than anything. Many, many victims are actually there. They remain there. Not necessarily because they expect the narcissist's love or they can't live without it or they're addicted to it. But as a form of pain relief. It's, it's, it's the only person who can take away the pain is my narcissist. Or if the other partner is also grandiose, the only person who can restore my grandiosity is my narcissistic partner. Mm. So it's a restorative function in many ways. And so, I think, sorry, go ahead. Mm. No, go ahead. Go ahead. I think I think we have a good understanding, right, of of it, and I think we have a good understanding from a a female perspective of what to look out for. I think the alacrity thing is very, very interesting as well. I hadn't considered that the speed at which the narcissist, the male narcissist will move this relationship process forward. This is something really for women to look out for, right? As well as the other things we touched on. Now let's reverse this and let's talk about men, a young man. He meets a girl, you know, he wants to, he finds her amazing. What should he, is, should he be looking out for the same things or is there are subtle differences, subtle nuances here? Than what it's, a good, it's a good question. The warning signs with the male narcissist is essentially about control. Right. Control, power, power plays, a symmetry yeah. of power, and so on. Mm. The warning signs with the female... So before I, before I answer your, your question, well into, well into the 2000s, 75% of people diagnosed with narcissistic personality disorder were men. And even today in the text of the DSM-5 text revision published one mm. year ago, it still says that 50 to 75% are men. The truth in the field is that half of all people diagnosed with personality disorders, uh, narcissistic personality disorder, nowadays they're women. Mm. Women have caught up with men. Mm. And women have caught up with men because women have become men. This is not some vaccine. These are studies by Lisa Wade and many others, which have proven, again, I think very conclusively, that women have adopted the male stereotypical gender role and have become men in the gender sense, mm -hmm. not in the genitalia sense or the biological sense. Or, they become men in the It's performative. It's performative. It's performative. performative. Exactly. Yeah. Gender, gender is performative. Mm. So they perform as men, exactly. But it's not only perform as men, 
they regard themselves as men. For example, there's a famous study conducted in 1980 and then again in 2020, and mm. women were asked to describe themselves. In 1980, they chose eight out of nine adjectives which were typically stereotypically feminine. Caring, empathic, you know, soft. Kind. In soft. 2020, mm. they chose eight out of nine adjectives which were typically stereotypically masculine. Strong, tough, tough. Strong, yeah. competitive, yeah. ambitious. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's not only performative. Their self-perception has become utterly masculine. Why am I mentioning this? Consequently, a masculine disorder, narcissistic personality disorder, is now universal because mm -hmm. everyone is a man. Even women are men. So they, they've acquired male mental health disorders. Additionally, the distinctions that used to exist in the 80s and distinctions I wrote about in the 90s, for example, between the manifestations of pathological narcissism in women and in men, these distinctions have all but evaporated. Mm -hmm. Male and female narcissists behave identically, with one exception. And that exception is what is known as histrionic exception. So male narcissists are controlling and antisocial. Controlling and antisocial. Female narcissists are controlling, less antisocial than men, and they're histrionic. When I say histrionic, they place an emphasis on the way they look, appearance rather than substance, for example. Mm. They minimize their intellectual and academic accomplishments. They act hyper emotional, and even to some extent, slutty. The raunch, the raunch culture. Yeah. Mm. Uh, so they would emphasize hyper emotionality, external appearance, hypersexuality as well. Hypersexuality, definitely. There would be teas There would be teasers. Mm -hmm. The chase, sexual chase, uh, and so on. So they would introduce sex and looks into the equation in a way which, in principle, should make you feel uncomfortable, either because you feel hunted. Mm -hmm. or because the superficiality and artificiality of this behavior is so evident and so pathetic that it's bloody embarrassing. So these mm -hmm. are, so all the signs of the male plus histrionic behavior. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But women narcissists would act identical to the men when it comes to decision-making, alacrity and all these, they would act identical. They would just add to it uh, ostentatious sexuality. Actually, we discovered in studies that women with histrionic personality disorder and women with narcissistic personality disorder do not like sex at all. And they rarely consummate. They are far stronger on chasing and teasing. But when it comes to sex itself, they try to avoid it or <laughs> run away or... Or don't Would that enjoy. be indicative of some kind of developmental or childhood trauma or no, potentially? A... No, manipulative instrument. It's Machiavellian. Mm. It's totally, it's, it's, I agree that it's instinctual and mm. possibly unconscious to some extent, but uh, Machiavellian in effect to manipulate. Similarly, women with histrionic and narcissistic personality disorder misjudge the depth of relationships. They regard relationships as far more intimate than they are. And this is the element of alacrity in women. Mm. So the male narcissist would focus on planning. Let's buy an apartment. Let's go, let's cohabit. Let's have children. Let's get married. He would focus on the logistics, the mm. mechanics of the shared fantasy. The women would focus, the women narcissist would be equally speedy. Equally, equal crazy, crazy making, but they would focus on, on the emotional aspects, the intimate aspects, and they would misjudge. So in men, in men, we have something called sexual overperception. Mm. Men misjudge female behavior, almost all female behavior, and they think it's an invitation for sex. This is called sexual overperception. In female narcissists and female histrionics, we have intimacy over perception. 
because they think that man is in love with them within a single meeting and so on, they want to get married and have nine children on the second date, but not for the same reasons as the male. The male wants to own, wants to own the intimate partner. The female narcissist wants the intimacy to secure the intimacy because intimacy is, is translated in the mind of the female narcissist into intimacy is translated as power mm. narcissistic supply accomplishment mm. he is mm. addicted to me he's my slave he can't live without me these are women phrases these are female phrases um, a man can say you know she never had sex like that i'm the best i'm the best in bed but he would never say for example I don't know. She can't live without me. It's, it's not a, a male expression. Mm, 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 it's a female mm, thing. Mm, mm, mm. But as you can see, these are nuances because ultimately it comes comes to the same. Mm. Both the man and the woman would press for an abnormal pace of relational development mm. for different reasons, but comes to the same. Both of them would try to control you. Both of them would make decisions. Both of them would, would disrespect your boundaries. Both of them would ignore your agency and autonomy or try to repress it violently and aggressively if you mm. show any signs. Both of them would use a shared fantasy, absolutely. The, the female narcissist would fantasize about the intimacy dimension of the relationship. We're gonna have a family, we're gonna be very happy, we're gonna have children. The male narcissist would do the same, but he would fantasize on having a trophy wife or having children that he can then shape and mold in his own, in his own, you know. Yeah, I mean, the, the trophy wife is obviously a reflection of his own prowess as well, because the more beautiful physically, the more admiration she's going to get from other males. And so you bask, if you're a narcissist, in the glory of the, look what, what belongs to me, that's mine. So that's what I said, co-idealization. Yeah. Co-idealization yeah, yeah. is if you are the owner, the proud owner, yeah. of an ideal object means you are ideal yeah if you own a drop dead gorgeous hyper intelligent super rich woman you mm -hmm. own her in the narcissist mm -hmm. mind he owns her if you're the owner of this device thing mm -hmm. object mm -hmm. then that makes you godlike ideal mm -hmm. it's exactly like a status symbol you know, and you the corresponding car. the corresponding thing on the female side then is she kind of owns him because he can't live without her. Yes. He's a and slave to her. He's yeah. addicted to her. He's addicted He's to her. He's a drug. Her. Yeah. yeah. She's irresistible. Mm -mm -mm -mm. Which means she has secured, in many ways, her own future and her children's future. If he's addicted to her, she's re secured a resource provider for the rest of her natural life in, in, in some ways. Most modern women don't think don't that way it. anymore. Yeah. Actually, yeah. they're trying to avoid long-term commitments and, and so on. Mm. Uh, very few want children and many of them refuse to cohabit or to get married. No, it's controlling an object. The same way you buy mm. a car. If you buy a mm. Porsche tomorrow or whatever, you're going to brag. Yeah, You're going to show it off. Mm. So here she is. She owns a man. And here he is. He owns a woman. Mm. And he idealizes the external aspects of the woman, and she would idealize the internal aspects of the man. Mm. His capacity for intimacy, his love. Mm. And he would idealize her looks. Mm. That's fascinating. And I think we've given people um, some very good clues there, okay, uh, about what to look out to, to avoid um narcissist can i ask you one more one more thing on the narcissism piece as a, as it relates to yes please. behavior right so um imagine you're um you're in a corporate environment right and you you suspect that the people you're working for the authority figures are your boss your immediate boss your team leader there's a pathological narcissism we've already established there's a per perfectly possible chance that he or she is what steps do you take? Are you talking about removing yourself from that situation, from that environment? Or how would you deal with that narcissist? How would you deal with that person? The because narcissists impose a shared fantasy in all types of relationships, not mm. only intimate, not only mm. intimate, but in friendships, in the workplace, in church, in mm. the army, you name it. Mm. Whenever the narcissist comes across someone who can serve as a source of supply or someone who can serve as a an intimate partner of some kind, 
Mm -hmm. The Gnostics imposes a shared fantasy. And in the shared fantasy, he is God and you are the worshiper. Mm -hmm. In the shared fantasy, he's in control and you are coerced in the shared fantasy. So the principles are identical in all the... So the advice is the same. Mm -hmm. No contact. No contact is a set of 27 strategies that I designed yeah. in, in 1995. And yeah. it's still the best advice there is. The second best advice, if you cannot go no contact, you have children yeah. with a narcissist, you can't lose your job for some reason, you can't move away from... So if the second best advice, which is not something I came up with, I regret okay. to say, but it's a great advice, is grey rock. To grey rock means to render yourself uninteresting to the narcissist. Mm. A bad source of narcissistic supply because you're stupid. Mm. Or you are incapable of curiosity. Mm. You're, you're not a worthy not, adversary. Not a worthy object to be owned. Mm. Narcissists don't have adversaries. They're God. Mm. What do you mean? What adversaries? Mm. They don't have adversaries. They're God. Mm. Some contemptible, inferior people may consider themselves to be the narcissist's adversary, adversary or enemy. Mm. But that's because they're deluded. Mm. And they realize the omnipotence, omniscience, and perfection of the narcissist, they would have never considered themselves were, uh, his enemies, because to be an enemy, you need to be equal somehow. Mm -hmm. So not, no, not as an enemy, but as a, um, as an object to be on. So if you are a rock, so you have great. to minimize your, the problem here, Sam, is if, if you're in a corporate uh, environment, and I have worked in a few, um, don't attract but, attention to yourself. Yeah, Minimize basically. yourself. Mm. Hide yourself. I mean, Robert Greene talks about this in the 48 Laws of Power as well, about never um, upsta upstaging the, 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 the master. Um, that's essentially the, is, is what you're talking about you're there. Compared, you minimize you're yourself. To stay. Yeah. You're forced to stay. No. Yeah. No, the, my first advice is to disconnect. Resign. Disconnect, yeah. Resign, literally. Yeah. Because it can end really badly. It can what, end really what, badly yeah. and can affect your future career. Mm. Narcissists, if they are mortified, narcissists can be narcissistically injured. Mm. It's when you challenge, undermine their grandiosity in some way, mm. their self perception or self image, mm. you cause them uh, discomfort by doing this. But they can also be mortified. Mm. Mortification, narcissistic mortification, is if you shame the narcissist, inadvertently even, mm. in public. The oh, narcissist yeah. is giving a presentation. Mm. And you raise your hand and say, I'm sorry, but this slide is wrong. Mm. You've shamed him in public. That's mortification. You mm. have become his mortal, his mortal enemy. Well, he doesn't have enemies, but you, you become something to be quashed and crushed mm. and destroyed forever and ever. Amen. Confined to the outer oblivion mm. of deep space. He's going to pursue you. He's going to pursue you for years. He's going to pursue you in all future careers. He's got, narcissists are exceedingly vindictive. Mm -hmm. when they're exposed to mortification. And mm -hmm. this is known as the external solution of mortification. It was first described by Libby, not by me, by Libby. Mm -hmm. So when a narcissist is shamed or humiliated in public, in front of an audience that matters to him, yeah, it's going to ruin your life period. It's going to mm -hmm. be, he's going to focus on this. This is going to be his laser yeah. focus. So mm -hmm. it could end extremely badly. And uh, the, the danger is in any environment, whether it's an academic environment or in a work environment, if you want to engage and you want to ask questions and you, you're curious, you're all, you, you could put your foot on a grenade, metaphorically, yes. with a narcissist very easily. Yes, and unfortunately, the incidence and prevalence of narcissism, pathological mm. narcissism, is increasing. Mm. These yeah. are study, studies by Twenge and Campbell, the newer generations, people under mm. the age of 25 under the age of 30 by now. They are much more narcissistic. They are five times more narcissistic. Do you think social media is fueling narcissism? Do you no, think... I think it's the opposite. Social media caters to narcissism. Okay. I think social media is a reaction to narcissistic needs. Yeah. But I think uh, the restructuring of society um, enhances or rewards narcissism. Mm. For example, people are now self-sufficient. Mm. Technology rendered them self-sufficient. Technology is also some kind of womb, a matrix, if you wish, mm. because technology is, is all-encompassing, all-engulfing, all-pervasive, the internet of everything. Uh, 
Mm. And technology provides instant solutions. And in this sense, technology is omnipotent, is omniscient, it's like God, is is godlike. Mm. So if you own technology, if you control technology, remember core idealization. If you own technology, then you are as good as technology. And if technology mm. is godlike, then you're godlike. That's why everyone in his dog nowadays is an expert about everything. Mm. People argue with medical doctors and with professors and with why? Because they have access to Wikipedia. Mm. Mm. So but they say a little knowledge is a dangerous thing, right? Sorry? A little knowledge is a dangerous thing. The, the, the classic phrase in, in, in English language, a little knowledge yes, is right. a dangerous thing because it, it gives the, 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 the purveyor of that knowledge um, a feeling of power. Yes, I think, I think there is a phenomenon that I call malignant egalitarianism. Mm. Malignant egalitarianism, we are all equal. We are all equal by virtue to, to having possessing access to the same resources. Mm. So you can surf the Wikipedia, I can surf Wikipedia, we're equal. Mm. And so people would not hesitate to argue with me about diagnosis that I invented. Mm. And they would tell me that I don't understand the diagnosis. Mm. And I better watch this and this. He mm. knows better, mm. or she knows better. And that's the diagnosis that I invented. Mm. And so technology em empowers people in the wrong sense and renders them more narcissistic. That's for sure. But I think technology was a reaction to the rising tide of narcissism. Mm. And we're going to see more and more and more and more narcissistic technologies because narcissism is a vicious, vicious uh, cycle, vicious circle. Mm. It is, it is self-generating, self-assembling and self-empowering. In short, the more narcissists there are, the more they structure society so as to reward narcissism. And the more narcissism is rewarding, the more narcissists there are. It's a, it's a, it's a feedback loop. Loop, yeah. Self-reinforcing feedback. Do you know in, in July 2016, New Scientist, yeah. which is a science magazine in the United yeah. Kingdom, as you know, New Scientist came up with a cover story. Yeah. July 2016. And the cover story said, uh, parents, teach your children to be narcissists. Mm. Yeah. That's where we are. Well, 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 well I mean, uh, yeah, I was going to ask you about that, this helicopter parenting stuff, um, where children not being exposed to any challenges. There was another thing I, I was reading this morning. I was actually watching. It was about council culture. Um, over 200 professors have been counseled in the United States. Um, in the last 20 years, um, a, a colleague of Jonathan Heights was talking about this, this phenomenon, and it's a greater number of professors that have been cancelled than, than all that were cancelled during McCarthyism in the 1950s. Um, what's your perspective on dark triad council culture, uh, what's happening in society? Do you think there's, there's elements of narcissism there? The sociologist Bradley said that uh, Bradley Campbell mm. said that we have trans we have transitioned from the age of dignity to the age of victimhood. Victimhood has become not only an organizing principle and a hermeneutic principle, principle that explains life, makes mm. sense of life, but also an identity determinant and consequently part of identity politics. Mm. Now, the problem with victimhood is this. If everyone is a victim, there's a problem to find who is victimized. Yeah. When you're a victim, you are compelled to find a victimizer. Even if there's no victimizer, even if your victimhood is self-imputed, mm. you would still work very hard to find a victimizer because the narrative would be incomplete mm. and ridiculous, mm. derisive, if, if you don't find a victimizer soon. So the studies... In Israel in 2020, four studies in Israel in 2020, other studies in British Columbia, mm. and, and recent studies in China and elsewhere, they're beginning to demonstrate, I think convincingly, that victimhood movements are infiltrated by narcissists and psychopaths who then take over and leverage victimhood movement, movements in two ways yeah. to obtain attention. It's a power and grab. And it's a power grab to penalize. Mm to sadistically use mm. the power to penalize, to coerce, not necessarily with a goal orientation, 
but to coerce is a performative action, mm. as, a, as a demonstration. To coerce ostentatiously. It's like a deterrent, if you wish. So many, many victim movements have been taken over by Nazis and psychopaths. Online, we have the empaths movement. Mm. There's no such thing as empath. It's clinical nonsense. These people are grandiose. Many of them are covert narcissists, I have no doubt. And yet they pose as these angelic, blemishless, faultless victims mm -hmm. who have been passively victimized by narcissists through no fault or contribution of their own. It's a classic splitting defense. I'm all good. The narcissist is all bad. I'm an angel. He's a demon. Mm. And many of them go to that extent. They say that Nazis uh, have been possessed by demons. Don't ask. Horrible. Mm. So it's an example of a victimhood movement which started off by me, by the way, started off by me when I established support groups of victims of narcissistic abuse and then metastasized and mutated into a narcissism controlled environment of ostentatious, declared, competitive victimhood, mm -hmm. thereby demonizing uh, the alleged abuser. This is an example in narcissism, but you have the same example in race, mm -hmm. the same example in, in now. When you when you have spotted the abuser, mm -hmm. when you have spotted the abuser, you need to demonstrate your power. It's part of the narcissistic psychopathic ma uh, matrix. Uh, rule book, you need to demonstrate your power. Deterrence in, in international affairs. Yeah. And, and you did mention that the vindictiveness aspect of it as well, yes. that there is a vindictive quality to the destruction of somebody's reputation and, and very often their career for yes. the most minor, sometimes agree, uh, of offense. Um, yes, it accomplishes several, several goals. You demonstrate your power, so you mm. intimidate others. Mm. You punish vindictively and visibly and conspicuously, so you you have restored your grandiosity. Mm. This is a grandiosity restoring mechanism. Mm. And um, you may even have converted people to the cause by doing this. So it's, there's a missionary aspect mm. to this. And this is true, for example, with me too, as well, because you, you're mentioning cancel. Cancel mm. culture. That's yeah. one aspect. <clears throat> but the Me Too movement, is, in my view, has mutated and metastasized. And today it's a vindictive, narcissistic, I would say psychopathic movement. Absolutely. Which is hell bent on transforming or reversing the power matrix or power parallel parallelogram between men and women. So a chauvinistic um, movement that is the equivalent of the alleged patriarchy. <laughs> it, 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 there are, people talk about elements of misandry. Misan, um, misandry, yes. Yeah. Out of it, yes. So that's uh, another example. Race, race relations, the same. It's bad. It's a bad situation because these movements start off is in the well. academy, they start in the, they, 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 were, they were meant, the ideas that were meant to stay within the academy, places for discussion. It's legitimate, it's legitimate for an idea to exit academy. And, and yeah. This, all these movements, almost without a single exception, started off with good intentions. They were yeah. authentic. They represented real, well grievances, yeah. real grievances. And I mean, women have been abused in corporate settings in the entertainment in the industry. No one is disputing this and so on. Mm. So they started off well. But then they've been hijacked by Nazis and psychopaths. And Nazis and psychopaths couldn't care less who is a victim and who is not, mm. as long as they are the abusers. Now these movements are abusive. Mm. Victimhood movements and victimhood identity politics are absolutely abusive, coercive, psychopathic, antisocial, and narcissistic. Period. That's not some blackening. These mm. are the recent academic studies. Mm. It is telling that these studies are not much more well known. No, they're Thank not. Um, can you point to one uh, off the top of your head? Of Gabay, Gabay in Israel, G-A-B-A-Y, and her colleagues, four studies, not one. Yeah. Gabay and her colleagues. There are others. I have, um, I have um, um, 
a series of uh, uh, videos about victimhood movements on my yeah. channel. Yeah. And in the description, you have literature. Yeah. You can find more.